I've gotten a question a couple of times, like, what are you meant to do right after you install Arch Linux? So today I'm just going to show you. So maybe you installed Arch Linux recently, maybe today or just you know, recently. You finish, you log in, and this is what you see. You're like, where's Linux? What is this? This is just, what? What, what, what do I do? So first of all, all this is, is, this is called the TTY. You can see TTY1, which all that means is terminal type printer, terminal type writer, something like that, which is just an old archaic word from when like computers were first made. But all you have to do here, you know, all you have to do is just type in your login. So for me, it's ed or ear dash, and then my password one, two, three, this is a virtual machine. And then you logged in. Now in the same way, if you do control, if you want to log out, all you have to do is control D and you'll log out. And if you want to log into root, then all you have to do is root and then you type in your root password. So in this case, it's one, two, three, four, and then you log into root. Now, the first thing you want to do, we're going to go, it's going to be sectioned by section, like important details. So first we're just going to talk about some more system admin things. So one of the first, first things you want to do is never log into root. Like I did here. The problem is root is too powerful. It's really powerful. Essentially it means if you don't know root, like just means like super user, like the admin, if you're coming from a windows background, like the admin of the computer. And essentially from here, you can, whatever commands you can do or type, there won't be any password required. It would just be instantly done. So the first thing you want to do is if you're logging into root, just control D log out. Next thing is you want to log into your account. When you log in, you want to make sure that your account is, you, you probably want to have it as a wheel or what they call like the wheel group which means that you're a super user. However, you're not a hundred percent, like you're not admin. So let's say right now, I believe, I think I am a part of the wheel group. So let's say I want to do sudo pacman, which is the package manager install Firefox. Then when I do that, it says, so I've never used sudo before. So it says, you know, trust. So I type in my password and yeah, so I am a sudo user. Now, if you were not a pseudo user, it would probably just say like, you can't, you're, you need admin permissions or whatever. So to set up your pseudo user, if you want to add yourself into the wheel group, the first thing you have to do is, this is kind of contrary to what I just said before, but you want to make sure you're on root because there's no other way you can, you know, add yourself without the root permission. So what you want to do then is you want to do user mod dash a capital G wheel and then your username so in my case it would be air dash and then you add it and it's that simple and you can add yourself to other groups but in general wheel group is the group that you want to add yourself into and i don't want to go into full detail because assuming that you installed your setup correctly you should already have your you know account set up and your uh groups and permissions but after that you should be able to use pr things like sudo and then you should be able to edit you should have all the powers of the root but only if you type in your password, which gives you some security. However, this is what we're going to be talking about. So let's get into the security is that the security in Linux, it's kind of like, there's no way to make your computer fully secure to make your computer fully secure. The, the easiest way get this is you just unplug your computer. There's no way you can make it secure. As soon as you start putting files onto a computer that are sensitive, then it's already going to be insecure. So, the only way is like, there's a balance of convenience and usability. So for example, one thing I've done in this terminal, in this um, virtual machine is that I've made my user password one, two, three, four, and same with the root. Now this is a very weak password. You should never use this. I'm only using this for demonstration purposes. And this is not actually um, like, it doesn't matter. Like it's just a virtual machine. I don't care. But for your actual password, you should do something more complicated. And again, I don't want to go into what's the most ideal password because there's many different things and especially password cracking software today is very sophisticated. So even if you have passwords, like, like a bunch of words, like do, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of dictionary words, they can crack it pretty easily, even if it's relatively long. So there's a lot of trade-offs. So you always want to make sure that you find a balance between convenience and, you know, usability, but also, you know, be safe, obviously with security as well, we're going to be going into this in a little bit more detail in, in a second, but if you want to be more secure, technically using Wayland is considered more secure than using XOR. And if you don't know what that is, we'll get into it in a bit. I'll have some more information, but if you already know, then consider maybe using Wayland instead. But again, there's drawbacks to using Wayland. It's newer, not as not supported as much as XOR. So there's that. 
you want to avoid, like I said, like you want to avoid running X org in root, uh, basically the same thing. It's just insecure and really so much info about security. That's too much to go in depth here. Cause I essentially want to make a quick overview of like what to do straight after install. But in terms of security, just make sure you've got a good password and don't log into root unless you really need to, for some reason, don't log into X or Google root. That's about it. Now with maintenance on Arch Linux, you have to understand that Arch Linux is a rolling release distribution, which is different to a, I forgot what the other name is, but essentially there's two paradigms. You can say that there's like windows. So windows has like windows XP then Windows 7, then Windows uh, 10, 11. Arch Linux has just Arch Linux. Like there's, you can see right here, like the only like version of Arch really is just the kernel version. But that's that's not even related to Arch Linux itself really. Like sure it, it is, but it kind of isn't. Arch Linux is just an operating system. There's no distinct versions. It's always updating. Every single day there's a new update. And whenever it... it especially if you want to be like on the bleeding edge, then you that's why you choose Arch. However, when you're using a ruling distribution, you have to understand there there is a bit of instability because, you know, updates are coming out. Sometimes an update won't be 100% tested and it will break in some very specific case. So you just need to understand that updating every single day is not a good idea. So again, I would recommend when you're updating, just be careful, don't update too often. I update roughly once a week or, you know, sometimes something just happens and you have to update. Like sometimes for me, my Pac-Man like installer, the like install package, it'll just break because you need to update the server list or whatever. So then I'll just update the whole system. But um, essentially that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that it's a good idea to subscribe to the Arch announce mailing list. It'll, I'll be, it'll be the first link in the description. And essentially they'll just put out some email to you when some major thing breaks. And to be honest, it rarely ever happens, like truly happens. And when it does happen, it's usually some very random package you've never even heard of. Uh, alongside that, when you're upgrading your system, make sure you are upgrading the, like don't do, don't do a partial upgrade essentially. So what that means is when you're doing sudo, actually, let me just, uh, so essentially when you're updating your system and you're doing sudo pacman dash s, you want to make sure you do SYU, which is a full system upgrade. And then if you, know, you type in your password, then it will be like, oh, okay, these packages need to be installed. You don't want to do SY, essentially, because that that's only a partial upgrade. You want to do, you don't want to do the overwrite flag when you're updating. Literally, like if you just want to update, just memorize this and that's it. Like you don't need to worry about anything else. Um, and you don't, you can't, you can, but you can't upgrade a single package it's very like not not recommended don't upgrade one package just upgrade the whole system okay because when you upgrade one package the dependency might need to be upgraded as well and then that dependency might there might be another package that is on that dependency but because that's a higher version it just breaks so it's just best to update the entire system each time never upgrade a singular package now moving on pac-man so you just want to understand that the repos, like the general repos, so when you're doing, so you just want to know that when you're doing, you know, sudo pacman and then at dash s and then whatever package, let's say Firefox, it's mo it's going to be safe. Like it will almost always be safe. You'll never have any troubles because th these are the official repos. They have like maintainers and, you know, people actually looking after it. So generally be safe. There is something called the AUR or the Arch User Repository, which essentially is all the unofficial packages. And it's actually a very powerful feature that a lot of people choose Arch over because it's just, you can get like the official repositories only have so many programs, but when you include the AUR, then you can download programs like way easier and still in the Arch way, if that makes sense. So like the Arch, you know, one of the greatest things about Linux is the way, like how easy it is to install. You know, if you want to install Firefox, pseudo pacman s Firefox and boom, you got Firefox downloaded. Whereas if you want to download some other, pro like if you want to download like Firefox on Windows, then you're going to have to download the installer, you know, unzip it and do that. On Arch, if it's not in the official repository and you wanted to download something completely unofficially, then without the AUR, you would have to do it in that way. But it's even worse because then you usually have to like do all this compiling stuff and it would take way longer. With the AUR, essentially you would call some AUR, or you could do it yourself, or you could use an AUR helper. That an AUR helper makes it like the best. And then after that, it will just literally like do everything for you. So essentially that, but it's more unsafe. People just upload, like you can upload whatever you want on there. Obviously, like if someone puts a virus and it'll be like, if someone notices, then it'll be taken down. Oh, I'm guessing they have like scanning software, but 
you know, just be careful. It's unverified. You can't be sure. Best to just like pick stuff, pick programs that are actually like widely used. So you're not just like picking, like if it's a random program, unless you like 100% know or you check the source code for yourself, like it's just, you need to be careful. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly show you guys how to install Yai, which is essentially, or Yay, Y-A-Y. Essentially, it's just a way to install AUR packages. It's very easy. I use it on my personal system. So you could either compile it from source or you could just download a binary. Today, I'm just going to show you a binary because it's just quicker. You know, when you compile, you have to like do everything. It's just, it's a little bit longer, a little bit more tedious. So all you want to make sure is that when you're installing it, first, you just want to make sure you have, I'm going to type this command. You want to make sure you have git and you want to make sure you have base devil and then just install. And although it's not, this is not necessary, it's very, very helpful, you know, because usually if there's something you're trying to install and it's not in the official repos, nine times out of 10, it'll be in, in the AUR. And if it's not there, then, you know, then you'll have to go to the last resort. But honestly, I don't like almost never have to download something completely by myself. Usually I can always use the AUR or at least the official repos. Now, after it's installed, you want to git clone and you want to make sure you have internet connection. And then you want to just type in aur.archlinux.org slash yai dash bin dot git. And if you want the exact download instructions, then you can go to the yai GitHub repository. I have it in the description for the binary download. Or if you want to do the compiled version, then you can also do it that way. From there, you want to CD. You want to change directories into the bin folder. And after that, you want to do make package dash sy. SI. And then after that, it should be basically all sorted. And then you should be able to download. Let's say I wanted to download like Libre, which I believe is only a UR. Then all you have to do is yi dash s, like how you do on Pac-Man. And then you type in Libre Wolf. And then it should prompt you to start downloading. Yeah. So there you go. Now, next, if you want to enable 32 bit support, which is important if you want to do, let's say, gaming, a lot of gaming applications and programs requiring it. Uh, only 32 bit and Arch Linux only supports 62 bit by default. So all you have to do, so to enable multi lib, all you have to do is you have to do sudo vim etsy pacman.com. Once you enter it, you want to find where multi lib is written and you, you want to make sure you don't make the mistake like I did earlier, uh, before, you know, recording this is that you don't want to just uncomment the include line. You want to un uncomment the actual multi lib comment as well. So we've got multi-lib uncommented and include. And then after that, you can save. Okay, so once you ran the pacman-sy once, it should be fine. And then once you do pseudo pacman-sl multi-lib, and I'm just going to pipe it into less. And you can just view all the different, you can view all the different uh, lib32 packages. And important ones, if you're like a gamer, then you have Steam, you have Wine, um, all here, maybe even Proton. I'm not sure if Proton is, yeah, not Proton, but you have a lot of packages like Vulkan packages and, and stuff that are only like in this 32 bit, like multi lib setup. So it's a good thing to enable, and then you can just download all the programs that you would need. All right, so now we're going to talk about graphics, and this one is going to be kind of up to you because you know you're going to have different use cases, you're going to have different interests and purposes. So in this tutorial, I'm going to be using Xorg because Xorg is just the default kind of, it's the most popular. And, um, however, there is also Wayland as I was mentioning earlier. So it's Xorg or, Xorg or Wayland. And essentially these are your like display servers and to, to boil it down simply, Xorg is old, it's bad. It's very, well, it's not bad, but it's just, it's a little bit insecure. It's just very like monolithic. Wayland is new, it's shiny, but it's unsupported. Xorg, I think a lot of people, like a lot of people hate on Xorg and, you know, FAIR does have its like necessary criticisms. Um, it is like a whole bunch of mess. But overall, if you want to use it and get almost guaranteed support for anything that you want to do, then you want to use Xorg. In this case, I'm going to use Xorg as well because that's what I'm familiar with. I've only played with Wayland a bit, so I'm not too familiar. But essentially, this setup, just so you know, is like completely clean. I've not installed anything. I've done the most minimal of minimal installs. So like the first thing you want to do is you want to just install X and it's going to say like, oh, well, which one? We're just going to be all. And then it's going to say man DB, man doc. I would just be one. Like whatever the defaults are, just install and then just let it install itself. And then, yeah, we're just going to sit here for a bit. 
But while that's going, um, along with like your display servers, there's also your graphics drivers. So if you're using like Nvidia or AMD, most of this should be automatic. And usually there's different drivers that you can install. For example, Nvidia, I think by default, will be using the proprietary driver. So it's, oh, you know, like if you don't want to be using proprietary software, then you might want to go and physically enable the, or digital, like whatever, but you want to manually enable the Novoro, Novoro, whatever, the, the open source driver. Um, with AMD, I'm pretty sure all the drivers are open source by default, but if you want to use some other driver, then again, you're going to have to manually do that yourself. But in terms of driver updates, it's all automatic. There's no need to worry about installing the latest version from of NVIDIA, like driver after the new game releases through GeForce experiences. There's none of that, just it's automatic. So Xorg is installed. One thing from now is then, like I've gotten a comment about this. It's like, like what about display driver, display manager? And display manager, I'm going to be honest, you don't need, you really don't need, I don't use one in my personal setup. You don't use one display manager is this, it's literally this, it's your login screen. It's like, oh, do you want to like, what do you want to do? And in my case, I only use my like, like specific setup. I use DWM. So there's no need for me. So I just type in my username and password, and then I'll have a script that automatically loads in my whole setup. Now, if you want to have it more pretty then Sure, you can enable one, but I just personally don't. But if you do, then just look up display managers. Um, there are some like, I know there's one like kind of terminal one that's like all kind of cool, but honestly, I just, I don't care. Like I just, I have it like this and I just have it loaded into my setup automatically. Then you got like the thing that everyone basically cares about is that your desktop environment and your tiling window managers. And essentially this stuff, again, it's all up to you. It's up to you, what you personally like, what you think looks the best that's what i pick just pick whatever you think looks the coolest or looks the best so in this video i'm gonna do i'm gonna do kde and i'm gonna recommend you start with kde obviously if you don't like like the look of kde then choose like gnome or something but overall kde is what i first tried but overall i'd recommend doing something that's very like lightweight is easy compared to you know let's say dwm because I'm going to be honest, DWM is a headache for me to use sometimes. So beginning, like being a beginner, unless you're so set that you want to do it for whatever reason, I would just honestly recommend go easy, go light. You don't need to go like full hardcore the first round. Or if you're already installing Arch, then you're already going to be procuring a lot more challenges than other people. So just, just go light with it and um, start with installing KDE. So for example, so in this tutorial, we're going to install KDE Plasma because it's just, that's what I started with. It's easy. That's why I recommend, you know, if you're a newbie and we're going to install it in a very minimal way, because if you install it with including all the applications, you're going to get all these applications that are just there that you don't really use and it's just blur, it's just blur at the end of the day. So all you have to do is sudo pacman s you're going to install plasma slash desktop for a minimal plasma install. And after here, it's just, again, I'd always, I literally just always pick the default fonts. The default thing so it's like oh which font do you want i don't care i don't care i don't care <laughs> and then you install and you can see like it's a bit of bloat it's a one gigabyte it's a lot of packages but i mean it's it's a full like it's a full desktop you know it's a full desktop that you can use so there's that and while that's loading i want to talk about like the tiling window managers now essentially you have so you have a desktop environment which is does actually include a window manager with uh kd i believe it's kwin k like whatever the case stands for, window manager. And essentially it's just manages like how the window is displayed. Now you can actually download a win window manager by itself. And, and typically these tend to be called tiling window managers. And that's like, if you look at my videos, that's the setup I have where it's automatically tiled and you can move it around. And it's like, essentially it's meant to be for like hyper productivity, but I doubt it really does that much, but I mean, it's cool. So that's why I do it. <laughs> essentially there's many different tiling window managers, desktop environments that you can install. And again, it's all up to what you think looks cool, but to keep in mind, tiling window managers tend to be a lot more like advanced. I think the easiest ones tend to be like i3. I think i3 is geared towards like more beginners. It's a, it's a little bit easier to edit and all that. But for example, like DWM is considered very advanced because it's like compiling and, you know, there's just a whole bunch to it. And then finally, there's also compositors. And compo to explain compositors, it's essentially like, it's just what makes like everything pretty. So when you see like my setup, when I open up a terminal, it will be transparent. 
and not only that it's like blurred and there's like these nice effects like it fades in fades out that is the compositor it's not the window manager it's not the desktop environment or anything like that and again depending on what desktop environment a desktop environment essentially is a is a window manager is a compositor and then is all this other stuff that is just all compiled to one monolithic application essentially so it's just built up on like smaller components but you can kind of strip away all that and you can have like a more minimal setup like mine for example okay so now we're actually going to look into how to boot into kde and um, how to basically have x in it rc and just auto run program so essentially the first thing we want to do is want to download sudo sudo pacman dash s xorg dash x in it and you know you type in your password and I've already got it installed, but you install that. Once you got that installed, you're going to have a couple new things. You're going to have a start X and you're going to have um, an X in it.rc file that actually works. So essentially the first thing, the very first thing you want to do is want to go into assuming that you haven't installed any other shell, you should have a dot bash underscore profile. And once we go into this, we're going to have, you might have some other commands here. This is what I had before. We're going to add these lines. So essentially, you want to copy this down. I'm just going to zoom in. So just explaining it. All it's doing is if this variable display is empty and this other variable is equal to one, then start X. Why? I don't know, but this is just what you type. And this is also just so you know, if you want to run it through start X, so you log into your terminal through like TTY, like you log in uh, through this, like you want to log in like this and then it just starts. Now, once you got your dot bash profile, like, set up what you want to then do is then you want to go and set up a dot x in it rc file that is in your home directory so so we're in the home directory right now we want to do vim dot x in rc and all you want to do is you want to type in essentially this is where you can auto run programs so here all i have is x execute start plasma dash x11 now if you're watching this in the future this might have changed it might be execute kde start or something like that but you just want to execute the program that starts up KDE. And also alongside that, if you want to run some other programs that you know start before, then all you'd have to do is execute, let's say D, I don't know, like some program, like some program. And then all you have to do at the end is type an at, and now execute that program and it'll be running along. So let's say you got a compositor like PyCom, what you would do is, and this is what I do in my own setup, execute PyCom and, and then, execute blah 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 and like the important sign is that the end and 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 then you finish it with no end here that says like this is the last program and it will stop running the script but essentially yeah that's all you have to do after that you can test out you can log into kde so i was actually in tty2 because if i log into tty1 it's instantly going to start but if everything works right when you log into tty1 so if i type in a dash one two three four it will just log you in and you can see we've got the logo and boom went so you've got a desktop setup now and um yeah and you can see that this is going to be very minimal like we look at it there's literally like no programs it's only vim and just some random like programs like system programs um and essentially yeah there's there's literally no there's nothing there's really nothing there isn't there isn't even a terminal so this is like kind of bad so what we're actually going to do first is we're going to log out and you want to install some other programs so for example so what we first want to do is we want to make sure we don't log into tty1 because it's instantly going to load up kde so what you want to do to swap tty's you're going to press alt and then f2 or f3 f3 and you can see like it swaps uh depending like for me this i don't know somehow it's alt f1234 uh, on the virtual machine, but in my actual computer, if I was to do Alt Control and then F1, F2, that's how I switch. So it's probably going to be Control Alt and then one of the function keys or Alt or Control. Just test around; it will be something like that. So what you're going to do then is just you know log in, and then we're just going to install some programs. So for example, we're going to install. Okay, so the K terminal is called Console with a K. Got. But yeah, so now that it's installed, we log back in. Okay, now that's loaded, we should have some terminal here somewhere. If not, then I don't know what to do. Oh yeah, so we have console. So now we can actually just do everything from here. But you can see this is a full-fledged like desktop setup, so we can actually just do everything that we'd want to. So we can just like bring it down here. And 
guessing that from now you probably want to use like some browser so we'll do uh we'll do firefox because i don't know that's just what everyone does and while you're here like you know i'm not going to download like everything i would because i'm not going to actually use this like, you just download all the programs that like you would typically use like as like a random like user so you can see like i got firefox like you're probably going to use some web browser and you know here it go here it is and you can just you know you can just use everything so yeah it's essentially like that simple you know you got youtube you can watch whatever you can watch all my videos okay so we're back so just quickly made a little bit of changes so it looks a little bit better but at this point i'd recommend just going through the like the system settings and kind of customizing it you know i put it in dark mode but, you know just kind of playing around with it and honestly kd i must say is one of the more customizable desktop environments so now we're going to go over some you know little tidbits some things that you want to enable such as numlock because you know if you're using a numpad having numlock by default is a very handy thing so there's a couple of ways to do it but i'm just going to show you this way this way it's immediately unlocked so when you're booting in and you're at the tty it's already going to be enabled so the first thing you want to do is you're going to use yi like we installed before and we're going to do make init cpio dash numlock you're just going to install it and then once it's installed all you're going to have to do then is you're going to add so once it's installed, you want to go sudo vim etsy make init cpio.conf because we're accessing the root directory. And then after in hooks, we're going to enable it after key map. We're going to do num lock. And the position does matter because you want to enable it right before like encrypt. So now we're quickly going to go over power management. And the thing is with power management on laptops, you just relating to laptops is that not every laptop will work you know usually the os part is the easy part but usually like stuff with you know like wi-fi that'll be trouble but alongside like power management like proper sleep proper hibernate it's kind of like hit or miss like sometimes it'll work sometimes it doesn't so that's just the thing you got to consider linux is you know unfortunately it's not up there yet it's not there yet. and then with suspend and hibernate if you want to if you want to put your computer to sleep, all you have to do is system CTL suspend and then should suspend. And when you, you know, remove it, when you touch the keyboard or whatever, it should reawake and it should be where you left off. Now, getting on to multimedia, should you use Pipewire or should you use Pulse Audio? And researching it, it seems that it's very like an individual choice because it really depends on what applications you're using. Because I read that some people, they have to use Pulse Audio because the games they want to play only support Pulse Audio. Or likewise, they want to they use Pipewire because the games they want to use only require Pipewire. And maybe I'm wrong. I'm not I'm not an expert. I really don't know that much about this kind of stuff. But I'm pretty sure you can have both installed, but like whether you can have them both enabled or what, I'm not too sure. I know my computer has both of them installed. Like I checked and literally has Pipewire and Pulse Audio. So it works for me. But um whether you can only use one or you could even use Ulsa, but it's generally not recommended because it's just very like limited. Like I'm pretty sure Pulse Audio is built up on top of Alt also because also has like it's good, but it just it's limited. So Pulse Audio builds on top of that. And I think Pipewire also is built on top of P Pulse Audio, not the other way around. But not entirely. Like it doesn't have all the features that Pulse Audio does. So it's like it's a it's a mishwash. Now we go to networking and with networking, again, you could there's so much that you could do to like really do like get into it. But all I would say is that, you know, download LDNS and all this does is essentially it just makes it that when you browse, the DNS server is like verified. So you're unlikely to go to a, like a bad malicious website, like will be blocked before then. So it's just a very easy, small program that just helps you out. Now, if you want to set up a firewall, I would personally say that, you know, I don't know that much, you know, in the uni course that I did, there was a unit where it was like we briefly talked about it, but we didn't like set it up or anything. So I really don't. I don't know. I can't say for sure. If you're very interested about setting up a firewall, I would recommend going to the wiki. The wiki will have many different firewall options and it'll tell you the advantages and disadvantages of each and every one. And like maybe how you would want to set it up if you don't already know. But essentially, that's all I know. Now, moving on to input devices. Now, if you speak another language or you type in different languages, now let's say you don't use the Latin script by default, like, you know, how it's like English I and mean, how you have it on the keyboard. Let's say you use Arabic and stuff and you want to write in different languages. Well, I'm not going to cover it in this video, but I have a card that takes you to one of my older videos where it talks about how to install. You just have to install another program and then it's pretty simple from there. With touchpads and track points, these all should work by default. Usually if you install Xorg, the dependency 
all these trackpads and uh, track points should work by default. If they don't, then you're gonna have to go research that for yourself. I can't. I can't help everyone. A couple final things. So if you want to make sure that you have fonts that work across the board, I would recommend downloading GNU slash free fonts. I believe Noto fonts, Noto fonts, and TTF JetBrains Mono. And after that, most you should see fonts for basically everything. And if you don't, then just you know quickly Google like why can't I see X font, and then you'll find out why. Now, if you're browsing and you're looking at, let's say some Arabic website, then it might be that you won't see, like if I looked up, I can't be bothered right now, but if you, I looked up some Arabic or Korean website, it would probably be all squares because by default, unless you install like a whole huge font package, then those fonts won't be supported. So that is something, if you're doing a very minimal install, like I have, that you're going to have to work and install yourself. So yeah, that basically covers it all. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't mention, but at this point, if you followed roughly what I outlined, you should have a setup like this, some very simple desktop environment, and um, you should be on your way to just learning and playing around with Linux. And that's really the way you learn. Like that's how I learned. I was just playing around. So I really recommend KDE. It's a very good, uh, I don't know, like not sponsored or anything, <laughs> literally just like, it's good. It has a lot of customizability. If you look at it, it's probably the best. I think it's one of the best desktop environments for customizability. That's what I would argue. But um, yeah, overall, I think it's a very good. There's a lot of stuff I didn't mention, such as like, I quickly mentioned it here, like shells. So here we have Bash. Bash is old. You can use something like Zish. Zish is what I use in my videos, if you see. It's more new. It's more modern. Uh, it has some nice features to it. And it's more, I think it's more community supported. I think Bash is just like a relic of the past, but it's just still used as the default. Don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure. You got optimization. You can really optimize your computer to like, your, especially Arch to be like as efficient, as minimal as possible. Um, but again, that there's a whole bunch of stuff to it. All of this stuff, just so you know, like I didn't just like come up with this crazy list. This is really just like a video about the general recommendations by Arch Linux. Like it's on a wiki. I'll, I'll post it in the link. I'll post it in the description as well. Uh, so you can have a check. You look at some of the details that I talked about, but in more detail with more clarifications, more like maybe even like a tutorial on like, okay, this is what you got to do to do this or whatever, which I simply just would not be able to explain all of it, especially to the level of detail that it goes to in the wiki. Furthermore, um, yeah, like all, all the stuff like multimedia, all of that booting, you can all find it in detail there. But overall, I really hope this video helped you guys. Uh, you know, I just wanted a video like a video like this would have helped me so much. Like, you know, just a bit of detail, some extra, you know, just so you know, like clarifications and just even seeing the process of like what it's like to set it up and, you know, how complicated really is it really isn't like it's just installing some programs and then typing in some lines of code here or it's not even code. It's just typing in a line of in this script or you know, file or whatever and then just get it working. So yeah, I hope this video has been helpful. If you want to help me out, please subscribe, like, comment, helps me out, share this video to others that are in a similar situation as you. And anyways, that'll be all from me. Thank you for watching. Peace.